Okay, or not, the recording has started. So, so we can start with your talk. All right. Um, okay. So thanks a lot, uh, Ayon and uh, and all the organizers uh, um, for, for this wonderful thing, uh, because this certainly brings a big big part of the community together in this somewhat strange time. So what I chose. Uh, 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 or decided to talk about today is uh, uh, is uh, some uh, uh, so so what what I decided to do is essentially a mixture of two things. One is uh, so first half of the talk would be pretty general and basic. Uh, so I apologize if you are an expert in this. Um, and in the second half, I'll try to tell you something a little bit more about some calculations that uh, that we have been uh, some of us have been doing recently. Uh, with an eye towards uh, some more ongoing work, etc., which I may or may not get to. Uh, uh, certainly, the technical parts I'll probably not be able to get to. Uh, that's also not the purpose. So I uh, I try to make it um, somewhat more general in that sense. Okay, good. Uh, before I begin, I should I should also say that if you have any question at any point of time, please do interrupt because. Uh, I mean, anyways, this is a slightly strange version uh, for me because it feels like I'm talking to the computer or the laptop. It's somewhat unsettling at times. So it's good to have interactions. So with that, let me begin. So uh, the brief outline, uh, this outline does not have much information other than just to say what I already told you uh, is I'll try to basically spend some time uh, try and essentially uh, I guess touch upon uh, some very very basic notions and ideas that uh, that are relevant in the bigger picture for sure. Also in this precise calculations, etc., that we uh, that people have in mind, and we are also trying to do. Uh, so that would be mostly fifty percent of the talk. So uh, it would be very very elementary, but hopefully not boring. That's my hope. So that would consist of essentially introducing the idea of ergodicity in classical and in quantum world. And in particular, for us, for our community, this has become uh, quite, uh, quite mainstream uh, since this paper uh, or this series of papers rather came about uh, uh, on uh, 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 chaotic properties of basically large CCFTs and so on and so forth or holographic systems. So there will be some discussions which are generic and from there uh, I would want to talk about some physics of rotating black holes in ADS. In particular, uh, mostly what I have to say uh, would be confined in, uh, in, in BTZ, the standard uh, BTZ uh, black hole in three dimension and the physics of it at extremal limit. So I will not uh, really make any statement beyond extremal limit even though there are many statements already that exist. And some, somehow the literature uh, uh, seems a little confused uh, about what to decide on, this, uh, on, on, on certain physical questions. So uh, one of our motivations, uh, if you wish, was to uh, sort of pin this question down uh, or, or make a very, very explicit and precise calculation uh, in the extremal limit. And we will have an answer. So, uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the premise. And then I will, of course, uh, try to uh, end with some conclusions, some outlook, some, some future directions, etc. So that's the rough, uh, rough outline. Okay, so let me begin with this, uh, uh, with this very, uh, very generic picture. So in the classical world, of course, we understand uh, very well, in fact, intuitively as well as uh, quantitatively, uh, what it means to have, a, have an integrable system versus a chaotic system. And generically, uh, we understand it in terms of classical trajectories. So for example, this is a picture that I took from, uh, uh, from one of the, I'm not sure if you can see my full screen. Uh, uh, maybe you can, because uh, some parts of it, uh, at least- I know it's, it's quite fine, Arnold. It's fine. quite, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. So, so this picture is taken from the reference that I have here. It's, it's a very nice reference. Uh, in case you have some time, I would strongly uh, uh, encourage you to go through. Good. So, so the basic idea is very, very simple. If you look at the picture on the left versus the one on the right, and you essentially have, a, let's say, a free particle in uh, in a uh, in a place with with 
uh, on the on the left diagram essentially uh, on a circular uh, stadium like configuration so the free particle will uh, of course move back and forth and we are imagining that uh, due to collisions it's not losing any energy and so on and so forth so it's elastic so if you if you if you uh, keep tracing all the trajectories eventually uh, at a, at a long time limit you will generate a diagram or or a collection of trajectories like you have in in, in figure a so as you can see that the full uh, space of trajectories in other words the full space so to speak is not going to be ever filled up no matter how long you wait uh, because uh, the trajectories the particle trajectories are going to be confined in the lines that are already shown so this is a very very nice structure and this nicety in some sense mathematically is uh, what you can quantify as integral great on the right hand side on the other hand uh, if you look at so if you basically just take the same system in other words the same particle but deform uh, your boundary in such a way that it becomes uh, like a billiard ball uh, stadium then the motion is uh, then and you, you, you keep tra uh, tracing your uh, trajectories for a long time then it's going to fill up essentially the whole uh, whole stadium or most of it at the very least so as you can see that there is no structure there uh, there is no uh, discernible structure there and it's all over the places so this is what uh, we usually call chaotic uh, I, I just want to point out that this notion of even uh, classical chaos is uh, not necessarily uh, uh, or may not match with your favorite definition of chaos because there are multiple definitions of chaos. This in particular is essentially a statement about how sensitive your trajectories are with respect to initial conditions. So that is really uh, all that we are doing. And with that respect, uh, we have this uh, two distinct features. So, uh, as I said, uh, a bit more uh, quantitatively. Yes. Uh, so, uh, I'm. Can I ask? Uh, okay. I think you were answering my question. I wanted to know intuitively how to know whether a system is chaotic or not from the equation itself. Uh, I think uh, this slide answers it. Okay. Okay. Great. So let me go go over the slide. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, so more quantitatively speaking, what happens is uh, if you have, uh, so let's say we have the, 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 the information of all the classical trajectories subject to all the initial uh, conditions and so on, then, uh, uh, then uh, as you can see, for example, in the left, uh, uh, so, so, so uh, in, the, in these two arrowed uh, lines, if I start with some initial condition Q of zero versus some other initial condition Q of zero plus delta Q, where this delta Q is extremely small, what can happen generally is that at a later time, these two trajectories may be very, very far off each other, even though they started pretty close at, at some initial time slice. So even though this initial perturbation was small, because of the dynamics, your resulting tra two trajectories end up at two very different uh, uh, or far apart places. Uh, so, so one way to quantify that is basically, one way to quantify this effect is to basically compute this ratio, del QT, del Q0, which basically says uh, that uh, how, how fast your trajectories or how sensitive your later time trajectories are with respect to your initial condition. And uh, you would immediately recognize that this is nothing but a Poisson bracket. And if this goes exponentially, if this goes exponentially uh, uh, fast as a function of time, then uh, then uh, we can call it we can call that uh, uh, say, yeah. Then we can say that uh, this is a highly uh, uh, you know, initial condition sensitive trajectory, or at least the system is so. And then uh, this exponential will, of course, come with some exponents some characteristic exponent, etc. So this is the exponent that is popularly known as the Lyapunov exponent. So if you wish, this, this slide basically quantifies the notion of chaos or the notion of uh, uh, initial condition sensitivity to, to classical trajectories. So if you want to compute something, you compute this object and that gives, a, that gives an idea of how chaotic uh, system is the classical mechanical system is so that's the purpose of this of this slide uh, yeah great 
Good. So now the question is, how do I define uh, uh, such a chaos or, or such a condition or rather such a notion uh, in the quantum world? And it's not at all obvious. The reason is very simply that uh, we lose the, the, the idea of trajectories, etc. when we go from classical to quantum. And there is no obvious analog of a trajectory in the quantum world. However, uh, this notion of chaos, I mean, on a physical ground shouldn't quite go away. Uh, as you go uh, in the quantum regime. So there should be a way to define. It. And it turns out that the answer is not necessarily unique. In fact, uh, uh, so there are definitions, the, the conventional definitions of quantum chaos are given in terms of the spectrum of the theory. So suppose you have a Hamiltonian, uh, quantum mechanical Hamiltonian, you work out all the spectrum of the Hamiltonian and there are properties of the spectrum uh, by which you can define uh, uh, something called quantum chaos. So let me give, give you uh, the conventional, a flavor at least of the conventional definition. So this is what is called uh, the weakness surmise. So the statement is the following. So suppose you have a system, as we just uh, described, you have a Hamiltonian, you could work out the entire spectrum. Then you ask the question that what is the probability uh, that, uh, uh, that in this energy spectrum, the level spacing or in other words, uh, the, the difference of two energy levels uh, um, are given by. Meaning, uh, so what the, the question you ask is, uh, let's determine the probability distribution of the energy differences in the system. And for a given system, you may be able to explicitly do that. And uh, the, the point is the following, that if you have, uh, 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 so this quantity is basically the left-hand side of this equation is the probability of an omega denotes your level spacing. Note that this is a very, very schematic form because you know, in, a, in a spectrum you have many energy levels, so there could be many differences and so on and so forth. So I'm skipping over those details. But roughly speaking, this probability, if it looks like an expression that is on the right hand side, where A is some constant, this N is some positive integer, and it follows as uh, exponential minus B omega square, then you can say that this uh, defines quantum chaotic system. Now the statement, uh, 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 a more physical way of saying it is you can see that if omega goes to zero, then if n is positive, p goes to zero, right? So, so if you just take omega going to zero limit of this function, you get a zero uh, result, which is, uh, uh, which is signifying that in this spectrum, you have no two energy levels coming together, coming uh, arbitrarily close to each other. So this is what is uh, popularly known or uh, more, more, uh, more uh, sort of conventional way of uh, saying that is that there is level repulsion, implying that the energy levels repel each other. So this is, uh, if you wish, if you have a system where you see level repulsion, you define, you, you categorize that system to be a quantum chaotic system. Now the, the very intuitive reason of that is, uh, or rather, uh, one reason of that is it has been observed that in quantum mechanical systems where this property holds, if that quantum mechanical system has a classical limit, then in the classical limit, the trajectories become exponentially sensitive. So, so this definition on examples is known to, to if you wish, uh, match to classical chaos. Uh, when you go to, uh, when you describe the system in terms of trajectories. This is the reason why conventionally this is known as, uh, or this is accepted as the definition of quantum chaos. So maybe let me, sorry, uh, maybe uh, let me pause for questions if, if there is any. So Orno, you're talking about a trajectory in the sense you're taking some kind of a random state, which is superposition of all these eigenstates and trying to see how sensitive uh, this, this level repulsion, this real level statistics will make it uh, sensitive to initial conditions provided um, in, uh, you are in the classical limit provided uh, this, when you take omega goes to zero, this P omega goes to zero. Uh, but there is there another, other things are also important, for example, that in this particular thing you wrote down, it looks like you, you cannot have very large gap. The probability of having a large gap in the spectrum is also uh, very small because of the exponential decay. 
Uh, so is there other features also important or just the level uh, repulsion? Oh, that, that is a good point. I, I don't know. I don't, uh, I mean, I, at least as far as I know, I, the only connection I have seen is uh, from the level repulsion, meaning that when you take omega to zero limit, not omega large, uh, that uh, uh, may not connect to, uh, uh, to meaning uh, what I want to say is that you can have a system where there, there are large gaps, quantum mechanical system, but uh, if the quantum mechanical system has a classical limit, in the classical limit, you may not find the classical system to be chaotic. Uh, on the other hand, for the level repulsion, uh, this is true. So if you have a level repulsion in the spectrum, it seems to match up to the classical notion of uh, chaos uh, when there is a classical limit. But there, I mean, it, it's not guaranteed that all quantum mechanical systems will have classical limit. In fact, uh, we know that uh, it doesn't exist in many cases. So, uh, so I'm just saying that uh, from that motivation, this is the conventional uh, way of defining quantum chaotic systems. Uh, but as, as we will see that this is not unique. In fact, it's far from unique. It's not clear whether uh, there is one notion of, of such a quantum chaos. Are there any examples? You said there are examples of uh, where this happens. Uh, uh, examples of when uh, there is the level the, yeah, which is a quantum system that where this mm -hmm. is known to hold for which the classical limit is chaotic. Um, good question. I, I did this. I actually looked for. I did not really find an explicit example. So maybe I. I mean, uh, okay. Can I can I look at, yeah. at it? Yeah. And, uh, we okay. also have an expert here, or Arul. Uh, sorry, is what audience? is the question? No. What is the, are there any examples uh, where uh, the, uh, there's a quantum system that has this level repulsion and the classical limit of that is chaotic? Yes, almost all of them are like that. I mean, uh, you have, for example, all the chaotic billiards or, you know, uh, uh, any... Uh, uh, there's a quantum of... version of the billiard ball, is it? Billiard? I mean, that's yeah, billiard. of course. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's just an extension of free particle you know, uh, usually okay. people studied. I mean, actually, the first example was uh, what's called uh, uh, Burimovich billiard or stadium billiard. Mm -hmm. So it's just a 2D, you know, cavity of a free particle moving inside of uh -huh. a, a billiard shaped under the, I mean, like a, like a stadium. So you can okay. solve the eigenvalue problem and there you'll find uh, uh, okay. this kind of thing. Okay, great. Yeah, and, yeah, so and I... I just have some comment about Ayan's question. Uh, you see, actually, the, the, uh, in, in terms of large spacings, so this, this particular Wigner submise, one has to massage the spectrum so that you can talk about universality. So actually, the mean level spacing has been brought down to one by some kind of mapping. So, yes. uh, so you won't find uh, very large uh, spacings compared to the mean level spacing. That's what you mean. I mean, the fluctuations will not be that much. Um, Thanks. Uh, can I suggest an example? Uh, maybe high energy CFTs, uh, systems which mimic high energy CFTs can be chaotic. I wanted to say maybe high energy CFTs, systems which mimic high energy CFTs can be chaotic. What do you mean by high energy CFT? Uh, CFTs which represent some strongly correlated systems and uh, whose spectrum is at some very high energy with respect to the ground state. Ground state of what? Uh, ground state of the system. Uh, uh, so, uh, are you suggesting that the, so uh, conventionally what? No not conventionally, in a, in a standard language, what we nowadays call chaotic CFTs are of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, strongly correlated, correlated systems, I guess, do mimic uh, uh, such CFTs, near phase transition. Right, but have you computed the, uh, the, the, the level statistics there? Uh, I guess there sh should be. Okay, I am not certain about it. Okay, because if they have, that, you know, you know, I do not know of, uh, of an example. 
Arnab, I just have one, you know, comment about your, uh, I mean, the classical, classical definition um, of the Lyapunov exponent, and uh, uh, that that implies chaos. It kind of, I mean, it really implies uh, instability. Yes. Chaos is in, instability along with some kind of boundedness. So just getting a positive Lyapunov exponent, like for example, just an inverted harmonic oscillator will also give you a positive Lyapunov exponent, but by mo no means it's you know chaotic. So uh, there has to be something further added into that. But just as a this thing of uh, as a, as a measure of sensitivity, that's fine, but not really as a measure of chaos. Some additional details have to go into that. Yes, I, I agree with you completely, which is, uh, uh, but uh, for, for at least, essentially, at least now, uh, what I have to discuss subsequently, uh, I will not be able to make that uh, precision. So, so, so uh, essentially, all I have to say from now on is really about this sensitivity or statements about sensitivity. Yeah, no, I understand that. That's, that's what most of the, I mean, much of the literature is really concerned with. Yeah. yeah. So you are absolutely right. Chaos is a much more global phenomenon. I can't right, just right. go trajectories and define chaos. Yeah, uh, absolutely right. Uh, oh. Yeah, indeed. And that may be very, very important. Uh, but at least I do not know how to. Right, right. Yeah. Thanks. But, uh, you, you, you will see later on in the quantum uh, thing, I have much more, I mean, a precise thing to talk about where this Lyapunov is rather uh, easy to understand uh, or incorporate. But the notion of chaos, as you are uh, uh, suggesting, uh, may not be, or maybe I do not. I just not thought about. It. Okay. Yeah. Any any other question? Anup, uh, can I ask yeah. one question? Yeah. So uh, in in the in your picture of this uh, classical trajectories you are shown. So any uh, any system which which trajectories is not closed is chaotic, right? That's what you mean. If it's not a closed, the trajectories are not closed, then is it a chaotic system? Well, what I mean, no, not, I mean, I'm not, you can't define this in terms of one trajectory, right? So the, the real definition is that if I have two nearby trajectories at some, mm -hmm. at some t equal to zero or t equal to constant slice, uh, they will differ uh, uh, at a later time. Uh, so they will diverge away from each other at a later time exponentially in time. Yeah, that I understood, but I was just thinking about this picture of the trajectories that you had shown uh, in the beginning. So, for, like for example, uh, for central force potentials, we know that apart from Coulomb potential and the simple harmonic potential, all other potential gives you trajectories which are not closed. So, right. will, will they correspond to chaotic system or? Uh... Uh, I don't think that is true. Um, no, I. I I don't think these two are equivalent statements. Mm -hmm. So you were saying that if I have basically uh, uh, non-periodic trajectories, is it a, is it a chaotic, classically chaotic system? That's your question, right? Uh, can I make a comment? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, systems which uh, follow Poincaré, Mendixon theorem uh, seem to be chaotic. Uh, I need to read more about it, but. Uh, no, maybe I can clarify on this. Uh, uh, no, I mean, certainly not. I mean, central potentials are not chaotic. Uh, uh, so they are actually integrable in the usual sense. So what you want here is a distinction between integrable and not, not integrable. Yeah. So integrable systems will have as many constants as the number of degrees of freedom. And there are some additional requirements. So if they are not then they can be chaotic, need not be chaotic. So uh, just because uh, orbits are uh, not periodic, certainly does not mean chaos. Mm. And uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Like, okay. like for example, if I mean, you just have harmonic oscillators with, you know, in, in commensurate frequencies, uh, it will be all open, open trajectories, but uh, certainly it's not chaotic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, so let me let me continue for for the time being. Uh, so this I just wanted to uh, let you know. I mean, and then there are, there will be more things like this that I'll just uh, mention. 
but not really dwell upon. Uh, you will see, but I think, I mean, just for some generic, I mean, it does some serve some generic purpose because it helps put things in perspective. So in that same spirit, let me just mention another thing, which, uh, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is basically purely in terms of uh, essentially, again, about, this, uh, about the spectrum, but not quite uh, what, or not quite in the, uh, not quite the kind of statement that we just saw in terms of uh, weakness surmise and so on and so forth. So, so, so this, uh, so this from this uh, weakness surmise, if you uh, follow sort of the history of the subject, uh, at some point you will end up with this hypothesis, which is called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And there is a reason I'm mentioning it. Uh, so the, the, the statement, let me just mention the statement first. So the statement is, uh, so let's forget about uh, quantum field theory and so on and so forth. Just focus on quantum mechanics. Suppose we have a Hamiltonian, we know the, the, uh, all the eigenstate, energy eigenstates, etc. So, so this is the roughly, very roughly speaking the statement. I take any energy eigenstate. This psi is an energy eigenstate, a particular energy. And I compute some expectation value of some operator, which I call a simple operator. So this is a very uh, demarcating uh, uh, feature. Uh, what it really means is that uh, this operator has to be sufficiently local. So I'll not attempt to make it more precise than that. Excuse me. But if you, if you do compute this correlator, or rather if you, if you compute this expectation value, then this hypothesis says that there are systems where, sorry, uh, somehow this, uh, okay, good. Uh, so where uh, this expectation value to the leading order, uh, uh, can be approximated by, uh, by a quantity which looks like a one point function in a thermal ensemble. So there is this beta that I, that I introduce in this equation. And any other uh, correction to this contribution is going to be exponentially suppressed where S is the entropy. So you can imagine that this is a very, very large suppression. And for practical purposes, in fact, you can also ignore that. So if you ignore that, you get an equation like this, which says that an expectation value of a simple operator in, a, in an energy eigenstate, which is a pure state, is essentially indistinguishable from the same operator expectation value in a thermal state. Now, how do I fix this beta? This beta is fixed by the following, that whenever we, call, we talk about this energy eigenstate psi, it comes with an energy eigenvalue itself. So there's an energy scale associated to the state. Now, if I know the Hamiltonian, I could equate these two sides. I could equate this energy of the eigenstate to some quantity, some formal quantity, which I call trace of rho h, where rho is nothing but, uh, uh, but a quantity which looks like a thermal ensemble. If I solve this equation, I will get beta. So if you wish, this equation gives me the temperature for the pure state, and this expectation value approximates uh, or rather tells me uh, that a pure state expectation value of a simple operator is nothing but, or, or essentially indistinguishable from uh, thermal, uh, thermal expectation value of the same operator. Now, uh, the, 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 there's a reason I'm mentioning it, is uh, you, can, you can sort of go away from this weakness surmise uh, kind of statement, which makes statements about level statistics, and come back to statements like this, and, and define a chaotic system or a quantum chaotic systems as systems which satisfy such a, such a relation. And this is not, not a very far-fetched thing. In fact, there's a very large class of systems which will satisfy this, uh, these relations. So uh, this is what is called eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Conceptually, I think it's, it's a very interesting statement which says that uh, if we only make local experiments, which we are anyways doing, uh, what appears thermal, we would never really know whether we are actually in a uh, pure state which satisfies ETH or we are uh, uh, truly in a mixed state, which is a, which is a thermal state. So that conceptually is, I think, quite interesting uh, in, in, the, in, this, uh, in this statement. And it defines a chaotic, uh, quantum chaotic system. So therefore, it relates in a certain way uh, 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 the notion of uh, essentially thermal description with, uh, with chaos. So that this is what I wanted to say. And uh, there are more statements like this along these lines, but we will not really uh, talk about them in any, any specific terms. But, uh, 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 but I just wanted to mention this.
So finally, I'll, I'll have one more thing to say about this. Uh, one, uh, the thing is that, uh, I mean, it's, so this, this fact that the O has to be a simple operator is quite important. So for example, if you take the Hamiltonian itself, uh, you know, the Hamiltonian itself of the system will not satisfy ETH because the Hamiltonian has, if you think about uh, certain spin systems and so on, it has basically interactions of all the kinds, right? So it's, it's highly non-local in that sense. It knows about the full system. So as simple or as standard as Hamiltonian does not satisfy ETH, but that does not mean these statements are, uh, 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 I mean, I just, want, I just wanted to tell you that there are uh, rather standard operators that you can think of, uh, which will not satisfy ETH. Yet these statements are, uh, the statements of ETH are actually quite interesting and robust uh, when they apply. So uh, good. Any, any questions about this? Arnav, isn't it too strong to say that ETH implies quantum chaos? No, no. So, so uh, okay, good. So uh, you can you can take this as a definition, right? So right now I'm just tell, trying to tell you that there are notions of quantum chaos, and there are various notions of it. So Wigner surmise is one notion. Uh, ETH is another notion, and uh, in some sense they are related because. Uh, this ETH, uh, I do not quite know exactly the history of it, but essentially, uh, I mean, both of them come from uh, certain con considerations of random matrix theory. So uh, they are naturally, uh, at least if not connected, they're naturally, uh, you know, there's a natural flow between them. Uh, maybe someone in the audience can explain more. Um, but uh, at, at this point, I'm just talking about what is my working definition of a, of a quantum chaotic system. So this I just wanted to say that this is an, you can take this to be an alternative or uh, to be one other definition of quantum chaos. Yeah, one, one can certainly say that uh, any system that has so satisfies ETH is certainly not integrable, right? But, mm -hmm. but to say that it is chaotic might be a, uh, because there should that probably is some kind of a gray area in between uh, chaos and integrability uh, yeah so so if you are asking for example the question whether eth implies uh, level uh, uh, level repulsion or not yeah for example yeah. that uh, that i do not know uh, the answer to uh, maybe orul knows and it would be great if you can tell us not really even i don't know enough about this but uh, I can just say that, uh, you know, I mean, the, the uh, Wigner surmise refers to the eigenvalues and properties of that, whereas this is really coming from the eigenfunctions. Right. And it sort of originates from the so-called Berry Oder's hypothesis, which basically says that any eigenstate of a system which is chaotic and look at its Wigner function, it will look like a microcanonical ensemble, yes. essentially, on the energy shell. So from that, Shredniki, I think in the 90s, he essentially derived the first form of this ETH. Right. Um, and that was the origin. So certainly quantum chaos implies this. And, uh, but again, it you know, rests on uh, properties of eigenfunctions, which are uh, seen to be generally true and so on, but not proven. Uh, within random matrix theory, yes, I mean, you can show some of these things. Right. Uh, now, whether there are non-chaotic systems, I suspect that the non-chaotic systems will, can also show this. Only thing, the difference will come in this order e to the minus s by 2. Mm -hmm. So that, that might have, a, you know, I don't know, a power law or something like that. So it can, it, it can because thermalization can happen in systems which are also non-chaotic. But uh, uh, maybe, that, uh, maybe that term there would, you know, differ. That's my understanding at this point. Yeah, right. Yeah, great. That's it's. Yeah, I mean, uh, so so this this as you said, this relation, uh, this possible connection also depends on a conjecture. Basically, the Berry's, Berry's conjecture, which uh, yeah, uh, which has sort of backing within random matrix theory. So the, you can ask basic. I mean, the, the the question about how valid or how much is understood of the connection between random matrix theory and quantum chaos. So I think that is uh, partial, uh, it's not complete. So in as much as that is partial, I think uh, this is also, but this one is an independent derivation. You can, you can say that from uh, leaving aside random matrix theory, taking the Berry hypothesis or 
uh, that kind of uh, statement which I said, and then as your starting point. So a very nice derivation of Schrodinger's. Yeah, yeah. And also, there was some work of Deutsch, who's uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I should have mentioned the people who actually did it, so Doish and, and Shedniki indeed, as you said. Um, great. So, what is I S mean, here? The that uh, uh, I was asking are, uh, I mean, if, if there are explicit examples uh, which can show that, uh, you know, uh, it satisfies one but not the other, that would be very interesting. So, these questions, I mean, the answers to these questions are, are not at all obvious. I mean, no, they're not even known. In, in certain sense. Or no, somebody asked what is S here. So in fact, I also have the same question is S, S you can also define from the thermodynamics that you just introduced. Yes. Or you yes. could also talk about the, uh, what is S exactly then is there, is there a num number, uh, this uh, density of states at that energy yeah. or? Exactly, this is the density of states at the energy E psi, if you wish. So E psi, I mean, so I should have mentioned that the psi has to be a sufficiently high, uh, highly energy or highly excited energy eigenstates. Uh, uh, then, uh, then it's usually more general or applies to much more, uh, I mean, uh, many more systems. Uh, but yes, indeed, I mean, S is basically just, uh, just counting the number of, uh, number of states. Uh, sorry, just a one question. Yes. Yeah. So this quantum prescription that you are mentioning, do they bear the notion of sensitivity to some initial perturbation in some sense? I mean, which is our classical understanding. Not that I know of. No. So, so uh, as I said, that the, the, there are various notions of uh, quantum chaos, and the weakness surmise, for example, in a way knows about uh, the classical trajectories. This, on the face of it, has nothing to do with any classical trajectory whatsoever, because these are expectation mm. values. And so I mean, on. I'm not talking about classical. I mean, some sensitivity to some initial perturbation to the state or something like that. Uh, not that I can see. No, not that I can see. Um, I mean, yeah, not, not that I can explicitly see. Um, I mean... You may be able to connect the ETA statement uh, in certain cases, like in random matrix theory and so on, to the to the weakness surmise uh, level statistics. But in general, uh, I don't think it's uh, it's clear. At least I do not know uh, a very precise statement to make. Okay. okay. In in some sense, you might expect that there is uh, is, a, is a notion because on the right hand side, you see you have an expectation value which looks like a thermal expectation value. So you'd expect that if there's a perturbation that has to decay very fast. So anything that decays very fast has, uh, I mean, usually the thermal correlators decay exponentially. So in that sense, there might be an exponential sitting in and that exponential may actually be inherited from uh, whatever you, some analog of uh, sensitivity of classical trajectories, but uh, I'm just guessing. Okay. okay that's Okay, so um, I think I'm going extremely slowly. Let me, let me just check the, check the time. But uh, Yeah, it is uh, already uh, 45 minutes almost, not wow. 40, 40 minutes. So, so how long should I go, by, by the way? Yeah, so you that, can take uh, 30 minutes more. Yeah, sure. 30 minutes, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So let me actually speed up a little bit more. Uh, so so uh, I'll just mention a few things. Uh, the, uh, as I said, so... For me, the, the interesting point of the CTH was that, uh, at least one interesting point is that, uh, you know, you don't have to think about mixed states to think about thermal uh, results. You can think, uh, you can indeed get thermal results out of uh, pure states or energy eigenstates. And in fact, I think this idea, I mean, as it holds uh, many interesting uh, implications uh, for standard quantum mechanical systems, you can go away from that for quantum field theory or conformal field theory, or even for black holes. Uh, even in quantum gravity, uh, where we talk about, I mean, essential uh, black hole thermodynamics and so on and so forth has many, many confusing aspects, including whether, you know, including the information paradox itself. Uh, so there it can play an important role, although I do not know uh, in what precise way, just, just a statement. So, so I guess the message, uh, one message would be that your macroscopic, indeed, you can view your macroscopic observables 
uh, for a pure state to exhibit thermal values if the system uh, to begin with was chaotic. So this is, uh, this is just a take home message uh, at this point. So let me, let me uh, skip from this part. All right, so some, some slogans, I guess. Uh, uh, so the physics of chaos uh, defined this way, as I say that the word chaos is being used uh, quite loosely here. So it's quite relate, deeply related to thermal physics. In fact, it is how it is defined. So uh, there's no escape, escape of that. And in quantum me mechanics, these definitions are not unique, but there are at least uh, more than one uh, interesting answers and uh, they are interconnected in some ways. But, uh, but it's far from, far from clear, I guess, uh, what the precise nature of the relations are. And in general, if you want to go away from this, you want to go to in quantum, uh, some, some version of quantum field theory description, um, it's a very set of, it raises a lot of interesting questions. And one place to start is basically just considering conformal field theories. And in that direction, people have already done a lot of work, which uh, I could have mentioned here, but there are far too many. Uh, so there are very interesting statements that exist in conformal field theory along these lines as well, which are relevant uh, for uh, for many purposes. Okay, so let me now. Uh, sorry, Arnob, I just want to add, add, a, add a quick question because I saw it on your slide. Sure. How does ETH? Uh, what does ETH imply for correlation functions? There was some mention of it on your slide. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, good. So, ah, thank you. So I can just quickly mention that you see, if you are if you're a conformal field theorist, such an expectation value you would immediately uh, incorporate or interpret in terms of a three-point correlate, uh, three-point vacuum correlate, right? So now you see that uh, if you want to define such quantities or such relations in CFT, uh, which is basically a precursor of defining your uh, such statements in quantum field theory, you have to talk about correlators and uh, whatever such uh, statements you can make, uh, which has uh, some notion of quantum chaos has to be made in terms of uh, correlators. It becomes quite natural from statements like this. So that's all uh, I wanted to say. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, so sorry. So I have to skim through a little bit uh, because uh, as I said, I'm going extremely slowly. Um, indeed, so yeah, that's this red statement here. Good. So let me now um, go back to the, the, the original classical description and uh, introduce another notion, if you wish, of quantum chaos, and that's the following. So remember, we, we defined this initial sensitivity as a Poisson bracket, and we know that if we have a semi-classical system, uh, then we take the Poisson bracket and promote it to a, a commutator. So therefore, if now a commutator, uh, uh, expectation value of a commutator uh, in a quantum mechanical system behaves uh, in the large time limit uh, or it grows in the large time limit exponentially fast, then we can call that uh, uh, some, uh, I mean, with our standards of uh, the word chaos to be a chaotic system. So a measure for this is obviously a generic diagnostic function such as this one uh, that is written here. So, uh, uh, so this is basically some W operator at time T and V operator at time zero raised to some power N, N is some positive power. I should have really put a absolute uh, value uh, symbol here because this is, uh, this is a real quantity, real positive quantity. Um, uh, and, and of course you have to evaluate this object, this operator, whatever it is in a particular state. So that's another definition if you wish of, of this, uh, this kind of uh, sensitivity or this kind of uh, notion of chaos. And a standard choice is to choose n equal to two in which uh, you get basically just a commutator square. Okay, so just a couple of words. Uh, so this is where, for example, uh, this, this definition departs a little bit from the earlier ones because it makes an explicit uh, 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 reference to the state in which you are doing the correlator computation. So previously we were talking about in some sense, uh, uh, either okay. about the, the spectrum or about, uh, uh, I mean, in the ETH, there was some, uh, some state dependent statements also, but this makes it completely state dependent. And just a remark that if you take n equal to one, you don't quite get anything non-trivial because what you are expected to get is a simple uh, linear, sorry, linear response theory and you have to at least get to n equal to two, such that there is some nonlinearity in the, in the correlator that you're measuring. 
and there you can get some non-trivial information. So let's unpack the letter a little bit. Yes. So, uh, I just wanted to get some more intuition of uh, how some systems uh, tend uh, tend turn out to be chaotic, meaning uh, their Poisson bracket grows exponentially, but uh, for other kind of systems, uh, uh, such sensitivity does not happen, meaning what is intrinsically happening mathematically, which uh, makes uh, some systems gr uh, grow with Lyapunov exponents and others not. Uh, um, maybe it's a vague question, but uh, if we consider the quantum mechanical version of it, uh, the square of the commutator of some operators is uh, growing exponentially, but uh, for other kind of operators, it's not. So what is essentially dis uh, classifying or dis uh, distinguishing two different systems to be chaotic or non-chaotic? Uh, so maybe we can respond very general questions towards the end of the talk because uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think yeah. it is better we just, uh, if you have some question on the, on the slide or maybe uh, we can, uh, because we are now running short of time. Yes, thanks yes. a lot. But, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't think I'll make it on time, but okay, let's see. Uh, I'll try to go as far as I can. Okay, so uh, so so let me just mention this one more thing, uh, uh, which is standard by now, but uh, but it's useful. So what you ha what if you unpack this correlator uh, for n equal to two, what you get are two generic pieces. And if you look at the, the structure of the correlators, so one of them has this V of zero W of T, V of zero W of T in a particular state, and the other one has V, V, W, W. So this one is completely standard uh, time order correlator that we are familiar with. However, this one is not. This is the so-called out of time order correlator, which is completely new that em emerges uh, or that arises when you try to compute such commutators uh, raised to some power in a particular state. And it is essentially these correlators which uh, have the information of any exponentially growing, uh, growing uh, behavior in time uh, at a long time, uh, uh, at large time limit. So these correlators, the time order correlators, specifically, for example, if you're thinking of a thermal state or for that matter, in a pure state, which uh, you know, at the level of correlator can appear thermal uh, uh, in, in the ETH-like style, uh, uh, for, for, for such states, uh, you expect that the time order correlators will have, uh, will have decayed exponentially um, and uh, there is not much happening at a large time limit, but these out of time order correlators will indeed know about, uh, uh, know about your large time limit or large time physics essentially. So this is what we'll, we are going to focus on. So uh, as so, I mentioned- uh, uh, Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. So OTOC is in some sense suggesting whether uh, the quantum mechanical system is retaining the memory of its initial state or not. So it's a good probe to classify whether the quantum mechanical system is chaotic or not using OTOC. OTOC. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sir. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's take that uh, basically as the gold standard for now, and let's uh, move uh, forward. So there's a particular view. Uh, so this is these OTOCs are quite hard to compute in general, but there's a particular view that can help. So let me just mention that view very quickly. So the the perspective is an amplitude perspective. So in the following sense. So suppose you prepare. Suppose on the you look look at the left figure, left left picture. You have a state, and at t equal to zero. So that state could be a pure state, um, uh, which satisfies something like ETH, or it could be a thermal state itself. Now, if you apply an operator uh, at t equal to zero and let the state evolve, uh, and you have to consider an evolution at a time scale which is much bigger than the dissipation time scale, such that this operator, the information of this V of zero has dissipated, and it has again become the thermal state. Uh, so if you do that, then you uh, get all the way to, uh, to a state like this up here. And at time t equal to t, you apply another uh, perturbation or another operator, which is denoted by w of t. So basically, this prepares for you a state like this. So w of t, v of zero acting on beta. 
Now, suppose I consider a, a particular process in which I take this to this state to be my in state. In, in, in some, uh, for some reason, I just want to define this as my in state. Correspondingly, I can define an out state exactly following essentially the uh, similar pictures that are drawn here. But that out state will be defined. Uh, let me define it in the, in the following way that B of zero W of T acts on beta. So that's my out state. Now, what is the out, the out of time order correlator that we just uh, saw in the last slide is nothing but essentially the, uh, the amplitude between these two. So, so the, why is this useful? The reason is this is useful is because if I can think of now, um, uh, let's say in standard quantum field theory perspective, so there are two particles coming in and two particles going out and the two particles correspond to basically the operators W and B. So this is essentially uh, computing an amplitude of a two to two scattering. So if you can compute a two to two scattering amplitude in quantum field theory in some, some form or some system that you have in this particular way, then you are actually computing an OTO correlator. So, the, so this, is the, this is the perspective that is, that is important. Uh, and let's, uh, let's, uh, let's go forward with that. I'll skip this. Okay, no, let me not skip it completely. Let me just emphasize the following point. So the following point is kind of important. Or actually, it's quite important. Uh, it's the following that these, uh, you know, all these non-trivial physics will appear uh, provided the system has a good semi-classical limit. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that, say, for example, the system has a very large number of degrees of freedom. Then, what you can do is you can indeed separate uh, your, uh, uh, your, your two time scales. One is the dissipation time scale, which is defined by the temperature of the or energy of the state itself. The other one is the scrambling time scale, which is defined as let's say log of n, n being the total number of degrees of freedom and so on and so forth. It could be some dimensionless combination made out of h bar and other scales that are present in the, in the system as well. So when you take h bar going to zero limit, this becomes a very, very large, large time scale. So if that exists, then these two time scales are separate and only then these OTO correlators can exhibit some non-trivial functional behavior. So basically when you do not have a semi-classical regime, then this, uh, this gap between the dashed lines completely close or fall on top of each other and you don't see anything non-trivial happening. So the point of this slide is just to make uh, the statement explicit that you do need a, a, a semi-classical uh, system of some kind for, for this physics to appear. So that's the basic premise. Uh, so why are we calling it to be the semi-classical limit? Well, uh, a semi-classical limit essentially means that uh, you, you have some parameter in which you expand and uh, you know in the in the leading order you uh, of that of that small parameter your system appears classical and then all the quantum physics you can basically control as an expansion in this small parameter so if you have a very large number of degrees of freedom sometimes you can just expand in one by n n being the degree, number of degree of freedom and that controls your quantumness if you wish yeah. But this is not always guaranteed. Not all the mechanical system will, will have some classical limits. Okay. Good. So, uh, so let me now. Uh, sorry. Any other question? Okay. Good. So um, let me now uh, just 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 tell you the following thing that we are going to do this two to two scattering in uh, let's say a space time now. Now we are going to do a scattering process in a quantum field theory. And the quantum field theory lives in a non-trivial geometry. Um, let's uh, some, some black hole geometry in ADS. So what is the story? The story is that, of course, is the Penrose diagram. And then uh, uh, there, are, there are two sides of this Penrose diagram. It's a black hole in ADS. So these are the two boundaries where the two CFTs live. And this two to two scattering process that we just described or we just saw is going to become essentially two high energy particles, which are shown as these two pulses on the left and on the right, coming in towards the bifurcation point and then going out. So if you wish this, the lower uh, bulges, the bulges in the lower part of the Penrose diagram correspond to the in state. The, the same things on the upper, upper part correspond to the out state. And you want to just compute their uh, amplitude. So this is an involved calculation, but nevertheless, so here are the basic ingredients that you, that you really need. 
So you need some approximation to do this calculation because otherwise it's, it's quite hard. So the approximation is quite standard in gravity whenever you want to view, view basically gravity as some sort of quantum field theory or fluctuations of uh, living in a, uh, uh, living in a non-trivial geometry and you want to quantize those, uh, those fields. It's useful to think about the iconal, elastic iconal approximation. What that means is you take a field and completely replace that quantumness of that field by essentially having a particle or a geodesic that goes, uh, uh, that goes uh, along an null ray. So the point being that uh, it's so highly energetic uh, particle uh, that it basically becomes a, a ma massless object and just, uh, just follows a null, null direction. And uh, therefore, you just completely replace uh, all the other non-trivialities of a particle uh, in a space-time by just simple geometric uh, uh, object of, of a geodesic or, or so on and so forth. And the elastic limit tells you that the amplitude is going to just be a pure phase. Uh, and the phase is going to depend on some Mandelstam variable, the S variable to be more precise. And to compute this, uh, this amplitude in, in, uh, in, in totality, what you have to do is you have to compute an integral of this form, which is where this object I have written is a very, very schematic form that the explicit expression is quite, uh, quite long and involved. But basically what you have to do is you have to do a momentum integral because you're computing an amplitude. So it's like a standard quantum field theory calculation where you do a momentum integral. And the integral will consist of a measure of uh, uh, over the momenta, that would be some standard relativistic measure, some factors of the momenta itself, then this exponent e raised to i delta factor because that's the amplitude, and then there will be some wave functions of the particles that are coming in and that are going out. So these are in the ADS CFT language or in holography, these are basically the bulk to boundary propagators. Now, if you do see this calculation, it's actually quite elaborate. Uh, at least there are many details, but you can do this calculation explicitly and you find that indeed this from this OTOC, you can read off a Lyapunov like exponent, meaning that uh, in, the time, in the large time scale, uh, in the large time limit, these OTOCs decay with a characteristic exponential fall off. Um, and from that, you can read off uh, your lambda L to be two pi times temperature. Temperature, this temperature is basically the Hawking temperature of the black hole itself. Uh, of course, I have set here H bar, uh, Boltzmann constant, C, all, all those equal to one, uh, but you can, you can uh, restore them as well. Okay. So any, any question at this point? So Sujay has a question that uh, uh, LSZ relates uh, time ordered correlation functions to scattering amplitudes. How is, how is it relating OTOCs to, how, how do you relate OTOCs to uh, scattering amplitudes? Doesn't it violate LSZ, LSZ theorem or is you need some generalization of that? No, so uh, great, great. Uh, thank you for asking this because uh, I have this question in mind for, for, for a long time. I have not found the answer, but I can tell you what my guess would be. So if you really want to do a computation of, so, okay, let me, let me uh, backtrack for a second. So the way you do LSZ reduction is basically uh, when you define your Lorenz, uh, Lorenzian path integral, and then you do uh, your, uh, uh, your LSZ reduction and you find that the, that the S matrix uh, or the scattering uh, elements are basically, uh, 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 can be written as, uh, as a sum over correlators, time, time order correlators and so on and so forth. However, uh, you can actually uh, go, try and go away from the Lorenzian uh, path integral and try to define your path integral on uh, something like a schwinger kellish contour. The reason I suspect that that might be relevant is because if you really want to do a quantum field theory calculation of an out of time order correlator, what you really need is a schwinger kellish contour and not a Euclidean calculation or a Lorenzian calculation uh, alone. So, only a Lorenzian or a Euclidean analysis will miss uh, the OTOCs uh, uh, on the, I mean, at an explicit level, it will miss that. So if you really want to connect uh, the story of OTOC with amplitudes uh, via something like an LSC reduction, I suspect you may have to do uh, or redo the, the analysis on a schwinger kellish contour. But how oh, it uh, works, I do not know. Arnob recently, uh, Vijay Balasubramanian 
another company has written a paper where they do this trick. Uh, they do actually do not need Schwinger Keldish contour at all. They do it in a v ADS Vaidya like metric. But what they do is they shift uh, the point on the boundary to a point in the bulk. Then the OTOC ordering converts to a time ordering in the bulk. I see. And this translation is done by, you need some extra factors to do this translation, but with this, you could also uh, convert the OTOC to time order in the bulk and then apply LSZ. I the, see. Trick, the trick is simply that, uh, okay, the main point is that it, it can be understood as a inner product of two states. And this is what allows you to apply this scattering analogy. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, that's that's great. But, but so so what uh, what I was trying to say really was a statement more in a quantum field theory. When you have things like ADS CFT, there you know any amplitude that you define in the bulk is going to be a correlator in the in the boundary. So so here, for example, the relation is much more straightforward in the sense that we're talking about correlators that are correlators of the CFT. They're not correlators of the bulk theory itself. Uh, in the bulk there, they can be amplitudes. Uh, that is fine. But in a quantum field theory, you can also ask that uh, whether the S metrics or amplitudes themselves uh, are somehow related to uh, out of time order correlators in the same theory. So I do not know the answer to that question, but I suspect maybe schwinger keldish way of doing it might, uh, might have an answer. But in ADS-CFT, uh, yes. I mean, ADS-CFT things might simplify. Uh, but I, I was not aware of this uh, this analysis though. So th thanks for uh, can I can take a look at it more. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Yeah. So uh, good. So uh, so sorry. By, uh, how much time do I have, by the way? Because uh, uh, ten minutes more, maybe uh, ten. <laughs> okay. Good. good. So uh, so th this is really the uh, the 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 trick uh, of the of the of the game. And uh, what you can find is uh, okay. Good. So what you can find is that, that there is a Lyapunov exponent that you extract and then these guys uh, in, the, in the, by now a very famous paper showed that uh, from this perspective, uh, if you define Lyapunov in this way via these correlators and so on, uh, they have to satisfy a bound and this bound is basically this two pi t. So in other words, in a, in a black hole, from a black hole in ADS, you get uh, the upper, upper value, upper limit of this bound. So black holes are in that sense maximally chaotic. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, just a small question. Uh, sir, uh, lambda L here is the phase. Uh, can we go to the previous slide? Sir? Sure. Uh, uh, if it's getting, sure. yeah, thank you. Sir. Uh, so it's like the delta is uh, something in the delta S, which is lambda N. Something in the delta S. Uh, e raised to the power delta. I. Uh, meaning, it, is it some phase which is occupied in the scattering process? Yeah, I think the question is, uh, where does lambda L appear in delta? How does lambda yeah. L appear in delta? It does not appear in delta. It actually appears in the wave functions. So in other words, uh, your, so your delta, by the way, is important uh, in the sense that how delta behaves with S, S being the Mandelstam variable. So basically what delta will do is spit out some factors of the momenta and then remember, you have to do an integration over momentum. So that's how this delta is important. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the feature of lambda or from uh, the, the information of lambda really comes from the wave functions. Now, uh, uh, sorry, may I make a comment? Good. I think lambda actually comes in the delta because this psi is ultimately will cancel when you normalize. It is this e to the power i delta and when you analytically continue will become this lambda l, I mean e to the power lambda t. If I, the shies won't be relevant because when you normalize, the shies will just go away in the numerator and denominator. So lambda actually comes in this delta. Delta is the most important piece here, I think. And when you continue, and you continue, it will just become to the power lambda t. Yeah, yeah or no, but I think Ovik is right. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, good, good. Okay, thanks. Uh, are good yes because uh, because you're saying you divide by the by the product of the two point functions, so that has the same information of the size. Right, right, right. Delta is the most crucial piece here. Okay, good. No, delta is anyways crucial if you want to uh, use this because uh, it, it depends on how delta behaves with momenta. So if right. you understand, or if for example delta is something else other than uh, so usually delta goes as s 
uh, proportional to s if it goes with some other power of s then it will not uh, yeah that is right yeah that is right it should be proportional to the mendelstam variable yes so that that is very crucial uh, yes yes case. yeah that's what i meant okay good so uh, it's in some sense suggesting that the maximal decay of the scattering amplitude in the euclidean picture cannot exceed the lepinov exponent 2 pi t yes yes and uh, even if that uh, there is a unitarity bound on essentially how fast delta can grow with function as a function of s so for example delta cannot grow as a function uh, of s square if it does uh then then it will violate some unitarity properties of the amplitude or of the s matrix oh. itself so that will translate into saying that you lambda l that uh, yeah, yeah. makes it 2 pi times t so t here is uh, assumed to be constant meaning uh, we are assuming that uh, the scattering happens at some instant of time and uh, we are uh, associating the temperature of scattering at that instant meaning uh, there are some ingoing and outgoing outgoing states and uh, there is some scattering at the event horizon and uh, some meaning t should be a varying quantity you know uh, it can even be red shifted or so so uh, maybe in view of the time can i question perhaps later yeah yeah i think we should yeah. go ahead yeah. okay so let me just uh, give you the basic uh, 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 result at least get, let me get to that uh, and then i can stop so uh, let me ask so maybe 5 minutes right so i have to ask a question and answer good so the question that you can ask uh, at this level is that various of this thing that i have been talking about so far one, one part consisted of what is the definition of um, Of, of a quantum chaotic system, and then there were various ways of addressing it. And now, in view of this bound, you can also ask that uh, to what extent uh, you know the, this bound is system specific, or uh, what other information of the system enters in, in, into the bound. Some confusion about uh, whether uh, this bound has uh, any dependence on. Uh, on conserved charges present in the system or not so suppose for example if you instead of having a thermal system you have a thermal system with some conserved charges whether the conserved charges will enter in this bound or not and then there are many papers some of them uh, 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 are uh, yeah um, anyway so so there are many papers uh, but so so what we wanted to do in 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 this work or in this work that i'm supposedly supposed to finish in maybe next 2 3 minutes um is specifically look at rotating black holes in other words uh, just look at btz black holes and in the extremal limit so so let me let me uh, uh, explain uh, what the extremal limit is but let me give you the answer right away the answer is that at extremality where the hawking temperature of the black hole will disappear what we find is if you do a similar calculation on a certain uh, certain uh, certain degrees of freedom that you introduce in the system you do find that it does have maximal chaos with uh, with the so called left moving temperature so let me uh, i'll define uh, right away what these objects are so this is what we call extremal chaos so note that the black hole the hawking temperature of the black hole is zero but there there are two other temperatures in the system one is the left moving temperature one is the right moving temperature so the left moving temp temperature actually survives actually still non zero at extremality and you can have degrees of freedom or in other words you can have correlators which are maximally chaotic with respect to the left moving temperature only so this uh, in some philosophical level at some philosophical level will go with some sort of an eth like state indeed given the operator uh, you can indeed find a thermal like behavior uh, and in this case we can indeed have a maximal chaotic behavior good so here is the btz metric i will not explain anything uh, in this because this is completely standard and also i do not have time but just i'll mention that uh, there are two horizons in the metric r plus and r minus and when you take r plus going to r minus or r plus is equal to r minus your hawking temperature vanishes but the angular mem momentum of the of the event horizon goes to 1 so it approaches speed of light 
and in that limit, uh, what uh, is basically that limit is basically what we what we call the extremal limit. But the Hawking temperature is 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 gone, so there is no temperature in the black hole phase. Now, so how do I get anything out of it? So, uh, so as I said, uh, that this this in the CFT, this describes a state which has a which has a temperature as well as uh, as well as some conserved charge corresponding to the angular momentum of the black hole. Now you could equate the partition function of that to be a product of the left movers and the right movers. So these are the CFT left movers and right movers. And from there you can read off the left, mover, left moving temperature and the right moving temperature, which I'll show also along the way, uh, in terms of the Hawking temperature itself. So this is the standard way of doing it. Now the way we are going to do it is the following. So what we will do is take this geometry and insert a probe string. So the string, uh, so roughly speaking, this is the schematic diagram. So suppose this is the bulk geometry. So this is the boundary at r equal to r uv. And there will be a string, uh, 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 which is a probe, uh, which is traced along the radial direction. And this will have a classical profile as well as some, some semi-classical fluctuations and so on and so forth. So the fluctuations, so we will study the fluctuations or the semi-classical physics on the along, sorry, uh, not along, but uh, around the classical profile of the string and their physics and the correlator uh, and the corresponding correlators uh, of, of, that, of that sector. So if we do that, uh, that's actually easy. Uh, at least uh, one particular way of doing it is quite easy. So what you have to st study is basically this number go to dynamics. And, uh, and uh, of course you have to make a, a gauge choice um, and we can choose the standard static gauge where the world sheet time is the space time time and the world sheet radial direction is the space time. Uh, sorry, world sheet space direction is the radial direction of the space time. Now there's a profile. So remember that there's a phi angle uh, in the BTZ which now becomes a function of T and R, and that's what you have to solve for. But in general, it's a hard thing to solve for, uh, except if you just uh, put in some ansatz, it becomes simpler. So we are going to put in some ansatz like this. Now, you see that this is an ansatz, which tells that the end point of the string uh, moves with a speed omega. So the, uh, so the end point of the string moves along the pi direction with, uh, with a velocity that is given by omega. So you can think of it, if it's moving in, in one direction, you can call it a left moving degree of freedom. If it moves in the other direction, you can call it a right moving degree of freedom, if omega is equal to one, because that's what the left movers and right movers are. But in general, of course, omega is uh, any value, omega can take any value um, uh, from zero to one. The absolute, uh, absolute omega can take any value from zero to one, okay? So this is a system you can easily solve. Let me not give you the details of the solution, but let me tell you what happens on the world sheet. So if you look at the induced world sheet, the on-shell induced world sheet, the induced world sheet gets a horizon. And when you have a horizon, of course you have a temperature. So I have written down the explicit forms of the world sheet horizon, the location of the horizon in terms of the R plus, R minus and omega. So R plus, R minus are the parameters of the, of the geometry. Omega is the, uh, omega is associated parameter uh, with the string. So this is, a, this is a horizon and then you can read off a temperature. So this is the world sheet temperature that comes out to be. So this is an expression given in terms of omega, TR and T left, but TR and T left are given in terms of R plus and R minus. Now you would notice that if you set R plus equal to R minus, you have TR going to zero. That's the extremal limit. And the Hawking temperature is given by this. So if you take TR to zero, then Hawking temperature also disappears. So there is no temperature, there's no Hawking temperature, there is no right moving temperature, but the left moving temperature, excuse me, this keeps happening. The left moving temperature is actually a non-zero quantity. So what you have is on the world sheet, even when you are, your background geometry is extremal, is strictly extremal. On the world sheet, you do still have a horizon with a left moving temperature. Well, proportional to it, up to factors of half and so on, but let's ignore that, okay? So now you can set up again the scattering experiment on the world sheet now, because we have a Penrose diagram on the world sheet. And the, then the fluctuations around, the various fluctuation fields 
uh, around the classical profile will play as uh, as the play the role of quantum fields right so then we can do the calculation and in particular we have the class so once you have a classical profile you can do a quadratic fluctuation that defines your gaussian quantum field, field theory and if you go to higher orders it will basically give you interacting quantum field theory and in that interacting quantum field theory you can do a two to two scattering amplitude in the iconal like approximation where the iconal approximation here will boil down to the, the, the statement that your string length is much, much smaller compared to the geometric curvature scale. Okay, so this is a calculation that you can do. And what you find is given here is that, the, that you can read off the Lyapunov exponent, where which uh, basically this, this C2 that we showed uh, earlier takes this form. Uh, upon normalization and, and so on. So it's one minus one by root lambda. This lambda is the Thoft coupling. This lambda L is the Lyapunov and this lambda L becomes uh, essentially the wall sheet temperature. You can also read off the scrambling time, but uh, that's, that's, completely, uh, that's completely transparent from this expression actually. And in the extremal limit, as I said, by the way, this expression is completely general. You do not have to take extremal limit here, but if you do, then you get that the lambda L, that the Lyapunov is indeed the left moving temperature on the, on the uh, for corresponding to the left movers of the geometry. So you can arrive at the same conclusion by doing some more, uh, uh, some more sophisticated analysis of uh, effective action and, uh, and, uh, and the reparameterization modes, et cetera, that are responsible for extremal chaos. But nevertheless, this is the result up to proportionality constants. The factors of two, et cetera, will depend on, the, what, on what kind of degree of freedom you are, you are looking at, okay? So, so one upshot of this is you can readily do this calculation in higher dimension because in higher dimension, doing any other shockwave kind, cal kind of calculation is hard, but you can do a string probe calculation because it's an inherently two-dimensional description becomes easy. And in higher dimension, uh, for example, in ADS4, you have something called a full of thorn temperature. So there are no left movers, right movers, but there is an, uh, there's an analog of that at extremality and strictly at extremality. These are called the full of thorn temperatures. So this wall sheet temperature now becomes a function of the full of thorn temperature and you can analyze this function. This figure, for example, is one such example uh, where uh, you know the ratio of the wall sheet temperature is plotted uh, with respect to the prologue thorn is uh, given as a function of omega, where these various values correspond to various uh, uh, angular velocities of the extremal extremal geometry. Okay, and such things you can you can indeed do. So let me completely uh, now uh, uh, now end here. Uh, I may not spend too much uh, time in saying uh, what the statement is, but the basic statement is that uh, the rotating black holes are richer. And indeed, for the extremal states, with this calculation, you can at least get a very precise and concrete answer, which depends on the left moving temperatures. And indeed, even at extremality, you can have maximal chaos. At some level, this result may even be relevant for uh, nearly extremal black holes that exist, let's say, in the universe, but I don't want to oversell it. Um, uh, because I mean, all this uh, really uh, cares about is essentially the near horizon extremal limit, not, not the asymptotics in some sense. So, uh, and there are many questions you can ask along uh, the lines or the notions of uh, connection of, uh, more precise connection of ETH-like ideas or level repulsions and so on and so forth. Some of them can be made a little more precise and uh, that's what we are trying to work on right now. But some others, at least most others, in fact, are, uh, uh, are quite generic and it would be very, very useful to make, a, make some progress in those. So, so sorry for going uh, very, very over time and thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for listening. Thanks, Arno, for this very nice talk. Uh, we can take some questions now. Yes. Yeah, maybe Malay, maybe Please other go. people can ask the question first. Those who have not got a chance to okay. ask. Maybe. I should mention, I mean, if you have a really pressing questions, you can also email me. Feel free to email me. I'll, I'll try to reply, maybe not as fast as you would like, but eventually I'll get there.
Yeah, so Mala, you can ask question, sorry, but uh, yeah, you can. Uh, oh, sorry, Nila has a question. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have a question. So this 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 calculation uh, or the uh, rotating black hole uh, picture that you mentioned, and uh, so has anyone uh, kind of attempted at you know charged black holes? Oh yes. Uh, you mean rotating charge or just charge? No, I think I think you know if you look at the you know metric way. Yeah. The fact that you have you know these two horizons and all, it kind of can be. If that's the, I'm trying to understand if. If that's the main feature of this whole game, then you know, charged black holes can also give you that playground to play with. Probably the CFT story will be more, more, more under control. Yes, but in there, you what you get is something a little more disappointing in the sense that in the charged black hole, you can indeed do this calculation, and uh, in fact, you can also do the the shock wave calculation in a much more controlled way. Hard solutions are not non-rotating solutions are simpler than uh -huh. here. Uh, you know, if you set strict extremality, you will get your Lyapunov exponent. So there, it's just proportional to the Hawking temperature. In other words, you do not have a notion of left moving temperature and a right moving temperature. I see. The only temperature you have is just the Hawking temperature. I that see. is the. the Okay. Uh, Arnold, uh, sorry, but uh, even uh, away from extremality, I don't think this uh, the charges Nila is talking about has an effect on the Lyapunov exponent. I think that's right. Yes, yes. Sure. I see. Okay, okay Arnob, I have something to ask. Yes, uh, so, uh, firstly, is uh, this curve CFT is a bit different from standard CFTs, right? So, so, yes. so is there some, some analog of the Maldasena uh, Stanford proof that you could give there? Uh, well, that actually people have uh, attempted. In fact, uh, I mentioned one reference. I think Indronil's paper uh, had uh, not, sorry, uh, let me just, uh, well, I don't have much details here. But uh, yeah, okay. So this paper by Indronil, for example, Indronil Haldar, uh, he attempts to essentially uh, uh, basically generalize uh, the Maldasena Schenker Stanford calculation in the presence of a conserved charge. So not considering any particular system, in other words, whether it's holographic or not, etc. So there are some conclusions he reaches at. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, he shows that, uh, or the statements are that uh, your Lyapunov can indeed depend on the temperature as well as the as the charge of the system, provided I think there are enough uh, states in the system uh, charged under that uh, conserved charge. So, sorry, uh, that, that sentence sounded weird, but so there has to be enough states uh, with a non-trivial charge. Uh, in, in, if that is the case, then uh, indeed uh, this proof can be generalized and uh, your uh, Lyapunov will have a contribution of that charge. Yeah. Now, ask a more specific question like warp CFT uh, that you are asking. I am not sure if anybody has done anything. Possibly something can be done, yes. Um, uh, yeah, possibly something can be. I have not thought about it whether how, how much it, interesting it might be, etc. I do not know. Yeah, I'm asking this question because if you go back to your slide, you had an expression in terms of uh, the temperature of the wall sheet in terms of TL and TR, I think. Yes, yes. Right. Uh, now this tells you, for example, if TL is zero, Correct. your uh, T wall sheet could be even larger than TR, no? Yes. So it looks like it can be as large as possible depending on omega. Yes, but omega has an upper bound. It can't exceed one. Ah, it exceeds, of course, it has an upper bound of one. So it then becomes four. So it is twice TR square. So it's like a root two TR. So it, it looks like uh, uh, this is something very interesting that you could, it, it's a, uh, it's a, you're putting a probe inside some medium and it seems to somehow have a larger uh, temperature. <laughs> That is quite, I mean, that is true, uh, but it also depends on, you know, it just says that uh, these questions depend on uh, not only the states, also the operators that, uh, that, you, are, that you are considering. So yeah. indeed, you can have two sets of operators in the same system, 
which are seeing two effective temperatures, for example, and therefore two effective uh, Lyapunovs. Yeah, my only question would be that, uh, so in the warp safety, if you could make some, this kind of notion of this effective temperature be understood from the, in the CFT language, like you're, essentially you're talking of some kind of a chaos on some probe theory or on, on some probe or defect in the CFT, no? Yes, yes. And uh, so, so is there some, yeah, maybe this is a, this leads to my first question, which you already answered. So maybe it's interesting to see it from the warp CFT, if you could understand this. Even the notion of this effective temperature for probe seems very interesting and something that yeah, perhaps. I mean, uh, probably some, uh, the, there is some interesting calculation that one can do in, I, I have not thought about it, to be honest with you. Uh, but uh, yes, certainly it's possible. Uh, and uh, I mean, yeah, indeed. Uh, and th there may be from a uh, CFT calculation, you can show that uh, yeah, one of the temperature should uh, come out as a, as a result of the calculations, yes. But a lot less is known about this warp CFTs, right? I mean, if you want to, so you have to compute a four point correlator. That's where the problem, I mean, uh, maybe- but just knowing the temperature itself would be interesting, no? Just knowing yeah. seeing the temperature itself. True, true, true. The temperature you can probably uh, uh, extract that much more easily, but if you are if you have four point correlators in mind, uh, that might have some challenges because you may need some information about the blocks, etc. And I do not know how much is known about uh, warp CFTs, uh, uh, conformal blocks, and so on. Okay, so anybody else has a question other than Malay? Okay, in that case, Mala, you can ask a question if it is short because we have to end soon. So maybe if it is not too long a question, you should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to get some more intuition of uh, the lambda L is equal to 2 pi t. So for the case of extremal black holes, uh, probably it's the temperature of the lift moving observers. For a general black hole, uh, so for a setup of a general evaporating black hole, uh, this Lyapunov exponent is uh, uh, what is it trying to classify? Which kind of temperature? Meaning, the, is it some redshifted uh, temperature at asymptotic infinity or the horizon temperature, or is it a dynamical quantity? Uh, I just want to. So, so <laughs> All these, uh, all these uh, are made in terms of correlations in the boundary CFT. So okay. the temperatures are essentially what an asymptotic observer sees. Now you ask, I think uh, at least one part of your question was what happens if the, if the geometry itself is dynamical and the yeah. temperature is changing? Well, then there are many issues. For example, first of all, if you have a dynamical geometry, I'm not quite sure to what extent you can define a temperature itself to begin with. Um, but um, so then the problem becomes much more complicated. Of course, that uh, all those effects are not counted for here. You're you're just assuming that there is a there is a geometry, which to a large extent can be approximated as as an object with a constant temperature or as a state with constant temperature. So it would be like asking the following thing: Suppose you you compute a correlator in a state. Um, and you get a result uh, in terms of, uh, in a thermal state, and you get a result, which is a thermal result. Now you promote the thermal state to also evolve. Uh, then it depends on the evolution, right? I mean, you could do some quench kind of dynamics and you can get some results uh, if you have a specific evolution in mind. But in general, I do not know uh, of a very useful, whether a very useful thing can be said actually. Uh, so it's uh, okay. so it's in some sense the temperature of thermal CFT which is in equilibrium. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, this proposal hasn't been uh, extended for uh, dynamical, meaning uh, for uh, for near extremal black holes. Can we generalize this uh, chaos bound? Uh, no, for, no. Uh, no. 
No, no. There, there are two things. Right? When you when you talk about black holes, whether they are extremal or near extremal, I think they are thought to be a states with a specific temperature. Okay. There, there is no dynamics. Uh, but if you insert dynamics, your black hole goes out. Uh, however, what you can have is as a result of the dynamics, you can have a initial state and a final state, yeah. in which you can define a temperature. So there, that's like a quench uh, kind of a setup where you start from one state, one thermal state, end up in another thermal state because you did something to the system. Uh, I mean, you, in this perspective, I mean, you can certainly in principle compute correlators, uh, but it's very hard uh, when, when you have a dynamical, when the state itself evolves. So not much I think is known uh, what might happen. Uh, the only calculation I can think of of a out of time order correlator is by Vijay Balasubramanian, I think. I mean, the, maybe even the paper that Ayan was mentioning, uh, they had done uh, something similar, something, something to this effect. But again, in holography as, uh, and also with this uh, special Vaidya kind of solution and so on and so forth. So in general, that's a very hard question. But if you have specific black holes in mind, then of course you can do a calculation to so much more, uh, so much more explicit uh, degree, essentially. Uh, I just had uh, one more question in mind. Oh, well, I think we should now end because uh, you just should two minutes, sir. Yeah, just two but minutes. okay, all right. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so you were also talking about state dependence. Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to get some more intuition of uh, what state dependence meant here. Meaning, you were saying that uh, the uh, two-point function or the uh, expectation value of some operator with respect to a given state can be uh, closely and uh, related to a thermal uh, thermal one-point or two-point function, but it's not a general feature, so it seems to be a state-dependent quantity. Uh, I just uh, wanted to get some more intuition as to why uh, one point or two point function is state dependent for uh, chaotic systems. Well, I mean, uh, so your question has many, many parts. First of all, uh, the, 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 the out of time order correlation function that I have been talking about is state dependence by definition, is state dependent by definition because you're computing a correlator in a state. In the, uh, I think the, in the last part of your question, you mentioned about one point function, etc. That was probably in connection with an ETH like statement. But even there, those statements are also with respect to a particular state. They are energy eigenstates. They're very specific class of states, but nevertheless, they're states. And uh, you, if you wish, the, even if the ETH holds, the temperature of the pure state, if you wish, the, the, the temperature corresponding to the pure state is defined by the energy of that energy eigenstate. So in that sense, it's the state dependence is also there. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I mean. I mean, in other words, uh, in very short, very brief, you have to compute correlators and correlators are always defined in a particular state. That's how the state dependence enters. Okay, maybe we should now conclude. Uh, Thanks thank Arnold, you, uh, for this question, uh, so, sorry, for this uh, nice talk and uh, you, we will, you. yeah, uh, yeah. And good to see you here. So, and to everybody else, see you next week. Uh, next week, we are actually having talk by Christian Jensen. He will talk about his work on ADS-3, in what sense it will be a dual to a random uh, uh, ensemble of random CFTs. Uh, so he'll be talking about that. Uh, so, so then see you everybody and uh, bye Ornob. Have a nice day and bye to everybody also. Can we clap? Yeah, sure, we can clap now. Yeah. But okay. Bye. <laughs> yeah, bye.